Amazing. Hello and welcome everyone to another brilliant interview to, on Hero of Health, where we interview heroes of health, both professionals and patients who use lifestyle and lifestyle medicine to address their chronic diseases, such as uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and even lifestyle cancers, such as breast, bowel, and prostate cancer. I'm Dr. Linda, emergency medicine physician from Sheffield, and I'm also a board-certified lifestyle physician. If you're new to us, well, know that you can join us every single Sunday at 5 p.m. UK time on Zoom, and watch this live streamed to YouTube and Facebook. So today we are speaking to no other than Dr. Hugh Bathel, author of Get Off the Couch Before It's Too Late. It's a work that I personally really support because it's something that I would love all of my patients to know about. Dr. Uh, Hugh Bathel is a retired GP with a particular interest in the use of exercise to prevent and treat a wide variety of the uh, degenerative diseases of middle and later life formed the first community-based cardiac rehabilitation center in the UK in 1976. He helped to launch the British Association for Cardiac Rehabilitation in 1992 and was its first president, a keen but incom incompetent sportsman, he says, uh, but I don't believe that. And as I mentioned, he's the author of Get Off the Couch Before It's Too Late and writer of a weekly blog that you can find on exercisefitnessandhealth.info. And you can check out this link in the YouTube comments and also on the Zoom chat. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bethel. Thank you very much for inviting me. That's really kind. And I'm not a hero of health, but I'm so very pleased to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you absolutely are because you have gone out of your way to bring evidence-based exercise information to the public, something that we need so, so much. We would love to start with um, you a little bit and what got you to get into medicine? Um, well, my grandfather was a GP. He was Dr. Hugh Bethel um, and, so it's, and his father was a GP. So it's sort of in the family. Um, and when I went to university, I thought, mm, well, I won't do engineering after all. I'll become a doctor and in those days it was easy you just said I'd like to do medicine and they let you I think it's rather more difficult nowadays it is definitely more difficult I guess because the population is increasing but because of that is why we need doctors so much more than ever um, and you have gone out of your way to actually in such an early time go and look into exercise medicine, something that we are still really not teaching both our medics and our patients. What made you look into exercise medicine? Well, I was very lucky because uh, I, I, when I qualified, I decided I'd like to be a dermatologist. And uh, uh, after a while, I discovered that I'd got to get membership before I could become a dermatologist. So I went and did some various jobs in other branches of medicine. I ended up working as a cardiology registrar at the Char old Charing Cross Hospital, which was off the Strand. And uh, there was there a remarkable cardiologist called uh, Dr. Peter Nixon. And in those days, you wouldn't remember, but uh, if you had a heart attack, you were put to bed for a few weeks. You were <laughs> spoon fed, sat on a bedpan, um, and when you were eventually discharged from hospital, you were sent to go and live a miserable existence at home, not doing anything for the rest of your days. And Peter Nixon thought this was all wrong. He said, no, you should get these people up and about. And uh, he had a mate who worked at the city gymnasium just down the road, who was a, an Olympic weightlifting coach. <laughs> and he sent his patients there. And all his colleagues thought he was mad. And uh, he was uh, generally thought to be quite bonkers to do this sort of thing with his patients, but they did very well. So that was my introduction to exercise for people with heart disease. And uh, so when I went into general practice in the end, I decided that becoming a cardiologist was too much hard work, went into general practice and uh, I found a very good um, local uh, sports centre 
which was just been just been opened by uh, Henry Cooper. You wouldn't know who Henry Cooper was, I shouldn't think, but he was he was a very well known boxer. He was one. He was a hero, a hero of the British sporting world, and he opened the uh, the kind uh, the sorry the sports centre in Alton. I went and saw the um, the chap who ran it, and I said. Uh, this is a nice place. Can I bring some people with heart disease along? And I thought he'd throw me out, but he didn't. He said, yeah, yeah, good idea. So that's how we started a cardiac rehabilitation program, which began in 1976 in Alton. It was, as you say, it was the first community-based cardiac rehab center in, in this country. So, And after that, uh, really, I stuck to treating people with heart disease for many a long year, but later in life, I get, became more and more aware that, that, that this, sh this should not be confined to people with heart disease. That is a fascinating story, and you really have gone out of your way during um, such an early time in medicine and i'm pretty sure everybody did think like today still that it was completely out of out of well like almost because you were going against the flow you were going again against everything that we believe and understand in medicine and it wasn't only for cardiac patients i if well when i look into history um that we were bed bound we still believe that being bed bound after operations of any sort being in bed when we are sick with anything at all is the only way forward and i believe in a lot of uh different countries it's still the norm a normal yeah. practice yeah yes yeah, so i i think one of the most uh, dangerous things that can happen to someone who is ill is they get admitted to hospital because they'll be laying in a bed or sat in a chair and not told to do told not to do too much and uh, i think that's largely down to the uh, inadequate staffing of the wards um it's dangerous to let people get up and wander around they might fall over um so uh, people come out of hospital considerably worse than they were a week before they went in almost inevitably unfortunately it is still the case uh, right now as you mentioned because of staffing issues but also i would say due to cultural reasons still i think it's really quite ingrained that we should be resting after an operation or during uh an ill, Ill health uh would you say yeah it, it it it's things have changed a lot in the last 20 years and i think now that people it, it, it is generally recognized even though it's often only paid lip service that getting people more active has to be good for them unfortunately it is as you say it's not part of our culture um, it's much easier to write a prescription than to uh, get somebody off taking exercise as part of their treatment um, and uh, it's uh, it's much easier for an individual to take a pill three times a day and go for a run three times a week so let's have a look at those patients with whom you started uh, early on how were they before they came into your cardiac center? What kind of uh, cardiac problems did they have? How did you tackle them? And what results did you see in those early times? Well, we, we, we took people initially, just people who had heart attacks. Um, and uh, they were mostly middle-aged and mostly male. Um, and we took them on about a month to six weeks after the attack. And we just put them through is a, a, an exercise program which was supervised for three months. Three, they came three times a week. And at the end of three months, we then uh, retested them to check that they improved to the le level we thought we should. They ought to have improved. And then we released them to carry on exercising uh, after that without so, such close supervision. Uh, still, we encourage them to come to the sports centre if they wanted to, but many of them want to go and do something different, like become walkers or take up uh, a sport of one sort or another. And uh, uh, after we'd been running for a couple of years, I offered it to the local hospital, um, Basingstoke District Hospital, it was called then, and the cardiologist there, a chap called John Fowler, he welcomed it. He was really enthusiastic about it, which was a tremendous help. So we became the first port of call for people after they'd had a heart attack. That was the next place they came to was us. Um, and in those days, we paid an extra, we had an extra role because 
in those days, people didn't have an angiogram after they'd had a heart attack. Nobody had a clue what was left, what was wrong with their coronary, what was the residual disease within their coronary arteries. And the first time you discovered that somebody had got um, significant residual coronary stenosis is when I exercise tested them, uh, when they came to us. And often we were a very, just a, a staging post for them going off to the surgeon. And uh, after a while, we then started to gather an increasing number of people who had heart surgery. So we took on people who had bypass grafting, but also people who had had valve disease treated. Uh, um, um, and we we expanded it over long I and mean, we were getting five you know 500 odd new people a year patients a year through the system um we we stayed in the uh, sports center for about uh, gosh i suppose about 15 15 years or so and we outgrew what they could provide for us we they didn't have the space or the facilities to accommodate what we wanted to do which wasn't just giving people exercise it was educating and talking about diet, making sure they stopped smoking and knew how to have a, a more healthy life approach to their lives. Um, and uh, so we, we raised, we became a charity, raised money, and we built our own centre next to the sports centre. Now that, that may sound a good thing to have done, but I rather regretted it in a way because it was much more uh, in keeping with people's future lifestyles, get them incorporated into exercise with other people not hived off on their own in a cardiac center so when uh, we started to have a, a re local reduction in the number of new you know that coronary disease has diminished in its uh, prevalence and frequent sorry its frequency not so its prevalent over the last uh, 20 years so we started to have a bit more space in our new center so we opened it up to treat people who hasn't got heart disease but might have been at increased risk, but also people who were getting frail or old or debilitated in one sort or another, or had other disease which might benefit from exercise. So that's been my focus in the last 10 years or so, is dealing with this massive problem that we're suffering at the moment, which is hugely increased population of frail elderly people and the result of having so many frail elderly people is you get many more old people with diseases disabilities chronic inability to look after themselves and the end result of that of course is the queues of ambulances you see outside character departments bringing in all these people who really shouldn't be there at all and wouldn't have needed to be there at all if they'd kept themselves fit and active. Uh, I used to have, well, I used to get people come and see me in the surgery and say, I'm so lucky I'm so well. And I said, you're not lucky, you're, you're, you've looked after yourself and that's why you're, you're old and well. Um, and the people who um, uh, uh, become ill, who require caring, who require care home looking after, um, are usually the people who haven't looked after themselves, they haven't done any exercise. And uh, I'm very tied into this idea of um, health, uh, the, the health span uh, as being a much more important part of, uh, uh, sorry, much more, a much better indicator of the health of the nation than lifespan. Um, okay, take exercise regularly, you'll live a bit longer. The important thing is you'll live well for much longer so that your period of debility and uh, need for care and look, looking after at the end of the whole life. I'm going on. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll I'll stop there. No, you're completely right. The we often are told uh, when we talk about lifestyle. Well, Linda, I have everybody has to die somehow, and I want to stress that it's not about the fact that we die because, of course, there is hundred percent death rates amongst all of us. But okay. it's how we right. But it's how we actually live those lives and. Um, there's, I think, a bit of a culture of thought that uh, just because we get older, we need to get sicker. But I think it's the way, uh, the opposite, exactly. Because we get sicker, we get older, younger. So I think we need to shift away from ageism and how we live our lives and start gaining health into our 
old age. And this is why it's so important to actually empower anybody after 35 to do that exercise. And as we know, sarcopenia starts after 30, 35, when we lose 3% of our muscle mass through every single year. And then you imagine when you get to old age, older age, you have lost your muscle because you haven't added to it throughout the years. So it's super important that we shift the mindset to think the older we get, the more we actually have to take care of ourselves and we have to exercise. So I just want to actually ask you about patients who did have uh, cardiovascular disease in the beginning. How would, they, how would their life have changed if they went into your program after a heart attack or if they didn't? What do you think, how would the two uh, um, patients look like before and after? Well, I can answer that a little bit because we, back in the late 1970s and early 80s, we did do a randomized controlled trial of our treatment. We felt that if we were going to offer this treatment, which was still relatively untried and relatively um, uh, unsupported, certainly in the health service, we needed to demonstrate that we were doing some good. So we set up a randomized controlled trial and we treated 200 people who went through the coronary unit at Basingstoke um, and randomized them into either coming to our center or not coming, just having what was then standard treatment. Um, and we followed them up over about 15 or 20 years altogether. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that the people who'd been through our program were much fitter uh, than the people who hadn't been. They were, they had cycle, they were better psychologically um, and uh, they were less likely to be smokers and they were more likely um, to be uh, much less likely to have angina and other symptoms that uh, were sometimes prevalent in those days. Um, and it was the, the trial was too small to demonstrate a change in mortality, but it was one of the trials that was included in the meta-analyses that were performed in the, I suppose, 1980s and 1990s, which were able to demonstrate that if you take a lot of programs, add in all their results, you found a, a, an improvement in survival over five years of about 25%. Um, so it was definitely a, a so I suppose if we did people any any good, we got we made them less symptomatic. We made them fitter, therefore more able to do stuff, um, and we reduced their their mortality. That's an incredible result. Um, that one that we hope and wish for everyone. I see a lot of patients in unfortunately in the, this acute state of having that heart attack, yes. and it's so important that we prevent them with exercise and lifestyle changes. But also, even if the event has happened, that we have hope of after all, after this event, that we can do something about it to strengthen our bodies, our minds, and actually have a better quality of life. So the question would be for those who do not have access to uh, the cardiac program. And I, unfortunately, in my region, a lot of patients do not. Um, they do not go on to any program really after a heart attack. They are given medication and then they just have to get on with it. Is there anything that we can um, share with them that could support their exercise regime without fear of um, incorporating that after such an acute event? Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry to hear that you haven't got such facility. There is now a cardiac rehabilitation units of some sort or another attached to all every single uh, hospital that treats cardiac patients. So the, there is, it's, it's out there, it's there, but uh, often it's uh, provided in, in rather inadequate uh, circumstances and, and doesn't treat people in the numbers that they could. And I think a lot of people don't, don't access it. I think that overall, the current rate of incorporation of people after um, heart surgery or heart attacks is about 40%, something like that. Um, the other sad thing is because it's greatly underfunded, the, what is offered in the hospital cardiac rehabilitation units is often rather less than was uh, the uh, level of exercise and um, lifestyle changes that was espoused by the original controlled trials on, on the basis of which, of course, cardiac rehabilitation has become respectable. 
a lot of people are scared to exercise, especially after a heart attack. Um, what would you say to them if they don't have access to the cardiac centers? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is exercise is very safe. And it needs to, they need to know that, that it's safe. And it's far safer now than it used to be. Because uh, when I was initially doing this, we, as I said, we didn't know what people's coronary arteries would look like. Nowadays, we know what their coronary arteries look like. And they've been stented to, you know, to kingdom come and uh, or bypass grafted. They're left. The vast majority of people who are, have come through the experience of a, of a heart attack are left with a good, uh, a coronary circulation and they can be very confident that exercise is quite safe for them so if there's no one to supervise their early uh, exercise then they have then, then they can be reassured it's okay to do it for themselves and i suppose that for most people the best sort of exercise to do is the thing they do most of and that's walking and if they can be encouraged to increase their uh, walking as, as, a, as a daily or for three or four times a, a week habit. They can be encouraged to build up, say, doing half an hour at a time and come up to the sort of level of exercise that's recommended by the Department of Health in its um, uh, recommendations for minimum exercise taking to ensure a good and healthy life. And then that's really, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. The, the, the problem is persuading people that it's safe to do it. And more than that, it's not safe not to do it. And I think you raised an important point of community. We found that when we started our walking group at Burley Health Center, that unfortunately people are very much segregated, especially after the COVID pandemic yes. um, and isolated. And it's very difficult to go out for a walk every single day alone. And so important that everybody tries to find uh, in their local communities, a few people with whom you, you could walk with, no? Yes, I, I think that's one of the nice um, developments over the last few years is, is the um, proliferation of walking for health groups. And I think there are must be few places in the UK that doesn't have walking for health groups within a few miles of where you live. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 that would happen. If the, I think ideally people should go through a cardiac rehabilitation program first, and if they want to carry on doing the sort of exercise that's incorporated that's fine but but it doesn't stop them doing other stuff and i think that uh, walking for health is a very good way of continuing to maintain your physical fitness but it almost seems like uh it is safer to go out for a walk than to sit at home and um, being worried yeah. isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and people used to say to me that, that I, you often see his recommendation uh, about exercise oh go and consult your doctor first but my view would be if you're not going to do exercise then you should go and consult your, your doctor but if you're going to do it just get on with it your doctor i mean doctors have a habit of telling people what they shouldn't be doing um i think in this case they don't need to be consulted if they want to do exercise that is such a strong and important point um because we are very often disempowering our patients to get on with it. Uh, and the body is very smart. It can teach us and tell us what it needs. We can slow down our walk or stop when needed as we get the feeling. Uh, we don't really need to hear somebody else telling us what to do all the time, but I think it's good to empower our patients to get out there get that, uh, those walks in. And then let's look at um, strength exercise, because that's something that is very much underrated, I feel. Uh, muscle mass does decrease, as we mentioned, with sarcopenia every single year after age 30, 35. So how important is strength exercise? Well, it is, it is important. And, and the, the program we run um, is a combination of cardiovascular workouts and muscle building. So they go around a circuit which uh, will alternate um, muscle building exercise with cardiovascular exercise. And it has to be important, although not so easy to do if you're on, doing it on your own. It's okay to go for a walk, but uh, doing muscle building exercise is much less easy. Um, I think people need guidance as they're going to do that. Uh, um, I like the development of the TheraBand system. I think that works quite well as both for leg, arm and leg 
exercises to try and build up strength. Um, but you're absolutely right. Sarcopenia is what people get as they get older. Uh, it's a, a degree of sarcopenia, I suppose, is inevitable. But you can slow it down hugely just by doing regular exercise and trying to keep your muscles toned up. So then let's have a look at the dangers of sedentary lifestyle and what does it mean it's too late. Uh, it could be too late uh, if we spend too much time on our couch. Um, if you can talk a bit about that. Um, yes, yeah, uh, sedentary lifestyle has received a lot of attention recently and there's no doubt that if you spend a, more than a certain number of hours a day in, in, a, in a inactivity or sitting down, it does increase your uh, cardiac disease risk and your risk of other diseases as well. Um, and I suppose, again, most importantly of all, it makes you more likely to get frail in later life. And um, if you are, doesn't matter much when you're 60, if you're 30% less fit and less strong than you should be or could be but when you're 85 it may make the difference between you getting being able to get out of a chair and get yourself a cup of tea or needing a carer to come in and do it for you so it becomes increasingly important as time goes by uh, i think it's very difficult to teach people strength building exercises uh, but but uh, most sports centers would take that on we have a system in our center which is called steady and strong which we use to help people build up uh, muscle when they've uh, got weak and i suppose the most most of you who come to us are in some form or another post-operative um and uh, one of the one of the reasons for all the ambulances outside a and e departments is because half the hospital beds are occupied by people who are too weak to go home and look after themselves Unfortunately, that is the case, and a lot of falls are happening in the later years because of that. And those falls result in uh, broken hips, pelvises, arms, legs. Um, and it's just devastating to see that due to the lack of cultural understanding, really, uh, we are not encouraging older people to exercise. I think there's a really um, big shift that needs to happen also in our gym systems where there is a space for people to feel comfortable to lift weights into their centenarian lives um what do you think um we could do uh, and how could we encourage um, the general public to actually start moving more well it's very difficult to, for, to get the message across to people the, the most effective um, stimulant to exercise, you know, doing more physically is having your doctor, and particularly if he's an important doctor like a cardiologist or an a &E specialist, telling them that they've got to go and do some exercise. And I think they do listen to doctors um, uh, more than they listen to, say, what the Daily Mail tells them. The um, facility is provided by most sports centres in this country now. Sports centres, uh, on the whole, do marry up with general practitioners uh, and to a less extent, I think, hospitals in providing um, uh, exercise, what's called exercise on prescription. So the doctor will scribble off a note saying, go off and take some exercise and they will, the sports centre then provide them with a set number of sessions at reduced rate um, to get them going. Unfortunately, it's not usually very well supervised, it's not usually very well monitored, there's a high dropout rate um, and uh, the system doesn't work anything like as well as it could. Uh, but if the medical profession was stronger on this, I think it would get better. And if the government were able to encourage it more and uh, even put some money into it, then I think it would be really important. I'm sorry to get back to my old, old hobby horse and frailty, but uh, Everybody, particularly over the period of the pandemic, bemoaned the fact that so many old people were ending up in hospital and dying. And uh, the result, the, the solution was clearly to provide more and better carers. Um, but nobody ever mentioned prevention. I never heard anyone talk about preventing the state of affairs. Politicians should be doing that. No, so there were two problems there. Prevention is never mentioned, but also what happened du uh, during the pandemic. We could see 
especially in AE, a devastating rise in chronic diseases after two years of lockdown. Yes. So whilst it was very important to keep safe from COVID because we didn't know actually the progression uh, of the infection and how it will affect our patients, it was also very important, should have been very important to encourage people through the lockdown to actually do the lifestyle changes that now they had time for increasing exercise, but instead we saw a huge decrease in exercise, increase in processed food consumption, a lot of alcohol and a lot of smoking due to this underlying kind of, we don't know what's gonna happen, stress, the unknown is very stressful sometimes. So we saw a huge rise in coronavascular disease presentation, malignant hypertension, high cholesterolemia, and ANE. We have patients in their 30s, many, many, many of them who came in with blood pressures 200 over 130, 135. It was devastating to see that the idea that we should be protecting our patients and uh, the general public from COVID actually resulted in a much higher rise of the chronic disease pandemic that we have been seeing in the background. Is that something that you have seen as well? That, that's a fascinating viewpoint. I actually retired from general practice just before, well, I stopped working in general practice in 2016, so I missed the, uh, that perspective. Um, although I did carry on working at the Cardiac Rehabilitation Centre running a scheme that we called the Stay Well scheme, because it was uh, designed, uh, if you read what it said on the tin, it was designed to keep people staying well, but I was, I was not really made aware of quite what was happening out there, although, although by reading I could, uh, the literature at the time, you can see it's, uh, it was quite clear that uh, the level of exercising in the community had fallen, for most people, there were small sections of the com of the um, com of the community whose exercise levels seemed to have in increased. But I think that the levels of obesity and, as you say, of hypertension and other cardiovascular problems did go up. I think there was a, uh, I think a meme or something that said COVID-10, that plus 10 um, kilos that people have gained through the pandemic rather than COVID-19. And that's exactly what we have seen in a and &E. Emergency cases or acute presentations of the chronic diseases have just shot through the roof. So it seemed like during the quiet period, while everybody was at home, actually a and &E, uh, presentations declined. But as soon as uh, the doors were opened up, we just see that saw this devastating effect of lack of exercise, sedentary life, but not only from an organic uh, cardiac or respiratory point of view, but also from mental health. Um, and we know very well that patients with mental health do live a shorter life. Uh, and of course, our head is connected to our bodies. And I think very rarely do we acknowledge that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that the, the other factor in all of this would have been the difficulty in uh, gaining access to general practice uh, and general practitioners, general unavailability. For, and that's not fair to say they weren't available, but the move has been towards um, the A&E department coming, becoming the first port of call for someone who feels they need medical attention. And that's been a great tragedy, I think. it's. Uh, led to really chaotic scenes, is not it? Absolutely. Uh, I, I heard a chap, uh, an ambulance driver, um, uh, being interviewed, I think, on the television recently, saying he really didn't become an ambulance driver to spend nine hours of his shift sitting in an ambulance outside a &E with a patient. Terrible. It was devastating. So if we have a look at uh, a little bit about uh, your book, um, for those, I would love to inspire many, many more patients and um, the public to have a read of it. Could we have a look at it a little bit on what should they expect when they read it and how they can use it in their daily life to gain health? Well, uh, it starts off with a description of what exercise is all about and um, what, what are the effects on the body of exercise and how much exercise you should be taking and what the effects on that will be on physical fitness. Uh, I make quite a lot of uh, um, about the fact that people don't take enough exercise and I also make quite a lot of the fact that um, uh, they often think they do. And if you look at the difference between what people think they do 
And what you find out they do when you measure it, it is awfully different. It's a very different fact. Um, I think the, when the HSC, it's a few years ago now, measured uh, what, asked people what they did, they were really quite pleased. About 30 to 40 percent of people were, were meeting the government's recommendations at the time. Uh, but that same group of people, they measured what they did. And the figure dropped from 30 to 40 percent to three or four percent. I mean, it was an amazing difference. There is a, a, a something called the social desirability bias, which I, I uh, hammer on about a bit, which is the desire we have to believe we do better than we do. So if you look at people's belief about exercise, you'll find that they do about half as much as they think they do. And you look at what they eat and they eat about twice as much as they think they do. Um, this is this is this, uh, and, and people need to know this because they need to know that they've got to be a bit more objective about whether or not they're doing what they should be doing in terms of taking exercise. So the, the, the book talks about that. It talks about um, uh, a lot about uh, different chronic diseases. And I, I have a whole section on chronic diseases and the, the, the place of exercise, both in the prevention and in the management of chronic disease. Um, uh, and th th that is, you've, you've mentioned a lot of them already, things like um, heart disease, lung disease, um, hypertension, obesity, osteoporosis, um, Parkinson's disease, the conditions like the common conditions, which will be both made much less common by if you're a regular exerciser and which uh, respond well to exercise as a treatment. And of course, the other things, of course, uh, the other important point that you raised, that's mental illness and dementia. Um, the, for people who take a lot of regular exercise, it, it doesn't prevent dementia, or it does for some people, but you will find that dementia de develops in a group of people who take regular exercise many years later in life than those who don't take exercise. It's very important. And, and then, of course, the, as I said, I'll bang on about it again, the problem of frailty in later life, which is the end result of all those chronic diseases you get because you never took the exercise, but also enhanced by the fact you've got no muscles to, as it were, deal with the uh, uh, increasing weakness of later life. Um, you talked in the first chapter nicely about the brief history of exercise. Could we touch on that and how it has changed in your opinion? Um, yeah, I, I can't take that chapter terribly seriously. It was a it was a, it was a gallop through through exercise, uh, the history of exercise. But it, it's interesting to see some of the changes that have happened in the past uh, two or three centuries the gradual reduction of the need to take exercise to earn your daily crust. Um, occupational exercise has gone down very much. There are very few jobs now that demand uh, regular uh, physical activity and uh, uh, many more that, re that require you to be sitting down uh, all day. And if you look at the, the, um, the time in life of greatest physical fitness is in your early 20s. And what happens then? You get a sitting down job. And after that, you're condemned <laughs> to decreasing uh, uh, fitness for the rest of your days. Um, yeah, sorry, I've rather lost my, lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where do no, you want to go from there? Exactly. You have a lovely graph in the book that shows from the 1650s that exercise regime just completely went down to the oh, point yeah. where we are fully sedentary now, most of the day, if not the whole day. Could we um, speak a bit about the actual sedentariness in our offices that we have for about 8, 10, even 12 hours sometimes a day? And how does actual sedentary lifestyle affect our health? Well, it's just, it, it, you, you wouldn't necessarily think, uh, de novo, that just sitting down a lot was going to make you less healthy. But in fact, it is a risk factor, particularly for cardiovascular disease. The more hours you spend sitting uh, down, the greater your risk of cardiovascular disease of one sort or another. Um, there, there, there have been some nice developments. I think some offices make you get up and walk about up every uh, half an hour or so. Um, they've, there is a development um, uh, of standing desks, 
some people stack can stand at work. Have you got a standing desk, uh, Linda? Yes, I am standing here right now, and it has revolutionized the way uh, I think, really, the, the way I feel. And I feel that there's just more space yeah. for the mind and the body to express itself. Um, and it definitely helped with both motivation to keep moving while I'm working, but also it increased, I feel, the uh, creative, creative process as well, because I don't feel stagnant in a chair. How interesting. I hadn't ever thought about that. That's a, that's a wonderful accolade for, for a standing desk. They also make a desk that makes the, the, the chair, sorry, that, sit, that will every at, at set intervals make you stand up. It just rises, so you've got to. Um, so there are ways, ways in which you can impose mobility upon the office worker. I don't suppose they used a great deal, but it's, a, it's nice to think they're there. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, the chair is standing up now. You got to stand up too. I love that. Um, can we talk a bit about the different type of muscles? So, so we have the uh, voluntary, involuntary, and the cardiac muscle, and how all of these muscles really require us to engage them for them to be healthy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, the you can't do much about your involuntary muscles. In fact, probably the less you do about them, the better, because one of the main uh, sources of activity for involuntary muscles is eating. <laughs> so you get your guts working. Um, so maybe we don't want them to work too hard. Um, the voluntary muscles, the striated muscles, um, there, there are two sorts, so the, the slow twitch and the fast twitch, but I don't think that's important. The, 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 it seems to be, as you've rightly pointed out, that you need a mixture of cardiovascular workouts for your muscles. That's muscles, that use of your muscle to make you thoroughly out of breath, running, jumping, uh, cycling, walking fast or whatever. Uh, and strength, which is uh, uh, it, it, it strength, the strength of your muscles is important. Fun enough, uh, the heart muscle is very different in its, in its performance, um, whereas in, in daily life, your biceps or your quadriceps or whatever um, uh, has a just removes a bit of the oxygen that comes to it the heart muscle takes out everything it can it, it your your the venous blood from your heart muscles is pretty well desaturated in oxygen um, all the time which is rather different to the um, problem or not the problem rather different to the case for uh, ordinary striated skeletal muscle I love the quote that you have chosen for um, chapter, uh, let me just see, yes, chapter five, <laughs> physical fitness, the best measure of how much exercise you can do, you chose, it's easier to stay in shape if you never let yourself get out of shape in the first place. Yes, um, yeah. I think that is a really powerful quote, but one that we, we have to just be kind to ourselves to know that it's okay to start again and again every single time and know that each time we start we will add a little bit of uh, residual resist uh, res residual uh, strength to our body and we shouldn't feel uh, immo unmotivated to kind of go through the, those difficult initial steps yes yeah, so it's got to, it if it's going to be really successful um, as it were uh, community-wide exercise should start in childhood and carry on and unfortunately uh, we have an increasingly sedentary population of children and teenagers um, they spend much more time looking at their screens than they do doing anything physical and active nowadays and very the it's a pretty small percentage that of children and young and adolescents who reach the uh, recommended targets from the department of health and that's a time of life when think people kids just rushing around doing stuff well they're just not doing that at the moment it's there's it been a big reduction and the government hasn't helped um whenever uh, a school tries to sell off its playing fields uh, the local population objects and the government overrules them it says they can sell off their playing fields uh, the, the um the, the number of playing fields that have been sold off since the, i think i think this is a correct quote it may not be absolutely right now but it was certainly right a year or two ago was that since the london olympics there's been school playing fields sold off every fortnight 
Wow. And, um, and, and, and uh, it's, uh, it, that's another, sorry, slight diversion, but uh, we do expect that inspirational events like the London Olympics or, or the recent ladies' uh, success in the football field um, would lead to more people taking exercise. I don't know what's going to happen as far as football in, in young girls is concerned, but I'm quite optimistic about that. But after the London Olympics, there was virtually no change in the exercise habits of the people who lived in and around London. Uh, and, and I suppose that was true across the country. It, it's, uh, it, it, we are a Com we are we are a community of exercise um, watchers, not doers. Where we should be doing it, we're not. We're spectators. Uh, it is devastating to see children being very scared of actually getting out uh, nowadays. They would want to, but of course, uh, the current norm is that we don't have the environment where our the kids can run around safely um, and that is very difficult for parents during such a difficult economical um, times when they have to work so hard and as you said the government is not creating and as you just mentioned actually taking away spaces from kids to be able to play safely um, in, I lived in many countries and I noticed a huge difference in also mental health of children when they are able to actually achieve something just like simple thing climbing up on a tree and uh, climbing down off of it, it gives them a sense of achievement, which then can build up uh in other parts of their lives in school and so on but this physical activity that they do outside can teach their mental health that they can do better and i think that's why it's very devastating that our kids are not only from a physical point of view but also from a mental point of view not able to um test themselves in this kind of setting yes i'm sure you're right it's health and safety has a lot to answer for doesn't it um climbing trees except you accept the odd fall don't you um or you used to but probably uh, that's not that would be rather frowned upon now yeah I mean, we've got to try and get people in, used to being exercisers from a very young age because i think if you never, haven't taken any exercise as a kid um you're not going to start taking it up when you're a bit older um I, there have been some nice initiatives i, I like the um the, the, the Daily Mile, uh, some schools have adopted this, uh, that they get their kids to do a mile's walk or run at the beginning of the school day. I think it's still a, a minority. I was talking to my grandson earlier today and you know, asking him about his school's Daily Mile. And he said, what? <laughs> and he looked a, bit, <laughs> looked a bit worried that it might be introduced. And, and, and uh, the, I think the park runs have been absolutely marvellous in getting people to Start, who wouldn't otherwise have exercised starting to run and they have a junior version of park run have you done the park run linda yes i have and here in um in rother rally uh, i do saturday swims and afterwards we have a park run as well it's Excellent. really brilliant and so many diverse patients and people come um really really great initiative definitely delighted to hear it yes that's why you look so fit and well well done <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do try. Uh, next to you, I always say the harder you work, the harder you actually have to exercise for your mental health, particularly. Um, and as a side effect, your weight will be uh, normal as well. But I want to touch a little bit about weight and how we focus on in current um, current culture in the Western world that we should exercise to lose weight. And I feel that a lot of my patients actually take on exercise, but if they don't see an immediate reduction in their weight, they actually stop exercising uh, because they feel they have failed at it. Um, very important to know that weight is just one single measure of the positive effects of exercise. Your mental health, your mood, your um, your strength increases, even if the weight doesn't shed, and how important it is to actually move for our mental health first, and then through our mental health, we can then uh, look at other aspects of our lifestyle that help our patients to um, shed the unwanted and undesired weight. I, I think it's terribly important for people who are overweight or obese to lose weight is incredibly difficult and it's no use telling them to take exercise because 
they will not take enough exercise to lose weight. You need a, if you want to lose weight from taking exercise, it's got to be an awful lot of exercise. And I think that the figure that was dreamed up a few years ago, which is probably about right, is you've got to run 15 miles a week to reckon to have an effect on your weight if that's how you're going to try and lose weight. Um, but and people do. Uh, I think I think the social desirability bias is a big, big factor because people do eat a lot more than they admit to themselves or are aware of. And they do exercise a great deal less than they are aware of or will admit. Uh, uh, and the, the only satisfactory way I know of losing weight is is to combine increasing exercise with reducing uh, in, intake. And that's very hard on people. People, by the time you're 35 or 40, you're hardwired into eating a certain amount each day. You're hardwired into doing a certain amount of exercise. And to change either of those is incredibly difficult. You've got to be very motivated. And I would have said that uh, the most important factor in helping people to um, lose weight is in, in, in trying to find ways to motivate them to do so. But, but it's very, very hard because it's much nicer to eat what you want to and do what you want to than, than, than take steps to uh, reduce uh, the intake and increase the output. Absolutely. And I did find, though, that, um, well, I, for my own uh, health, I went on a whole food plant based diet, increased my real food intake, which is very difficult to actually get hold of, even in, well, even more so in hospitals, yes. uh, where you eat actual fruits and vegetables before they have been processed into a takeaway or into a bar in case yes. that they plant nuts. Um, yeah. And increasing those real foods really, really helped to be able to actually increase my energy that I have needed to put into exercise um, later on in life. Um, so let's have a look at what is the equation that we need and in chapter six, you mentioned how hard and how long do we need to move exercise um, so that we support our health and not so much about lose weight, but supporting our health overall. Yeah, that's very important. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there's much more to the benefits of exercise than your weight. And there are, it is a recognized condition that there are people who are both overweight or obese and physically fit. I have to say it's a rather small percentage of the obese who are also physically fit, but they, they do this. So you can. And if you are physically fit, you can uh, 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 overcome some of the uh, disease um, promoting properties of being obese, uh, being physically fit. Um, I've now completely lost my point. Can you tell me the next part? <laughs> You're very right. I want to mention on that. You said there is a group of patients who are uh, physic uh, obese, but they are physically healthy. Yeah. And I want to mention that there is one out of four slim people who have now metabolic disease. Um, one out of four slim people, I want to repeat that because very often we focus on patients who are overweight and very rarely do we make it clear that even if you're slim, uh, as per cultural norms, you're still at the risk of having metabolic syndrome, which is the underlying cause for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high yeah. cholesterol yeah. and heart disease. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, although again, I think it's much these conditions and particularly metabolic syndrome are much rarer in sl slim people um, but being thin yeah and up to a point we do inherit some of the problems we develop i, I had um, a, a friend of mine uh, after i'd written an article in the local village mag about the dangers of uh, well about the causes of diabetes type 2 diabetes which i said was largely due to um, eating too much not exercising enough and she said here I, I eat very little i take lots of exercise i'm very slender but i still got type 2 diabetes I, so i i took it on the chin and said absolutely right yes about 15 percent of, of type 2 diabetics are, are type 2 diabetics not really because of their um, body habitus but because they've inherited that particular um, tendency but it is it is a minority and, and, and when you're it, uh, looking at public health, you've got to look at what is good for the greater, the greater good for the greater number. 
exactly and i think we hide too much behind the genetic uh um kind of mantra that our genetics are destiny but yes there is a small percentage of people who do develop these diseases primarily because of genetics but they are really the minority and i think we are hiding too much behind that both as patients and as doctors to a not take the necessary exercise and lifestyle changes and be in the in the doctor's case to not um not the doctor but the medical health system not to actually prescribe lifestyle changes because it takes a little bit maybe longer time but i think that's a misconception because i can do it in emergency medicine i i think we can do it in other places as well yes yeah, so, and uh, uh, leading on from that is the tendency nowadays to regard say obesity as being a disease which needs uh, um, careful treatment by the by the medical profession rather than a condition which people over which people have some control themselves and of course if people think they've got no control over what's happening to them that it's just because of their inheritance or whatever then it's going to be very much more difficult for them to uh, overcome the problem I, i'm not very much in favor of regarding obesity as a disease. No, uh, we have to empower them exactly as you said. Uh, we have to empower patients to believe that they can and then offer them the tools that they need um, from, from a medical perspective, because as you said, we have the need to kind of step into the equalizing shoes that we are just as responsible to bring this information as it is for patients to take it on yes i think so and patients do i call them patients the customers or whoever they do listen to their doctors or some of them do um and uh, if uh, if a doctor makes a strong recommendation for exercise as a way of treating their current problem i think that can be very powerful it is. And in lifestyle medicine, we have seen papers that have showed that doctors who do exercise themselves are actually more likely to offer the solution. But of course, in current strains in the NHS, unfortunately, we work harder and actually there is less time to do so. But I believe the more we work, the more we actually have to take the chances of uh, take the opportunity to take care of ourselves and not take the chances. Yeah, yeah, we've got to set a good example, like with smoking. Doctors gave up smoking, didn't they, before any other profession? And maybe, the, and there are plenty of doctors who, not very good examples in terms of their physical activities. They've got to set a good example before they can expect their customers to listen to what they're being to told to do. Absolutely, and definitely something uh, I we, we we in lifestyle medicine try to mirror uh, as much as possible. Because how, who are we to tell people what to do if we don't do it ourselves? Um, it's a. I would love to ask you just in relation to the equation of what is the minimum exercise that our bodies really need to uh, be able to gain health every day rather than lose it. How much exercise per week, both strength and cardio? As much as you can possibly do, or as much as you, you feel that you are able to do. Um, there's been a very good uh, study from the States produced within the last couple of weeks, a chap called Coquinas, who looked at um, a large group of people who have what do you call veterans? I mean, these are older, middle-aged, older people who have had their fitness tested on a treadmill and then followed up for ten years. And there, he found there was no threshold um, for either improving your um, uh, life chances uh, and, and uh, freedom from disease. Uh, there was no threshold for the amount of exercise you needed to do to achieve that. If you do very little, it's a start. But um, it, the more you do, the better. There has been a, a, a feeling, and there's been a lot of publication about this, that suggests that if you take too much exercise and get too fit, you then start to suffer from ill effects of it. It's not true. The more you do, the fitter you are, the longer you live, the healthier you are. That's a great message. Um, and Besides um, exercise, what are the other pillars that you hold very important? 
Oh gosh, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm a bit of a heretic here. Um, I find that exercise allows me to eat what I want. It allows me to be as greedy as I wish. <laughs> uh, so I don't uh, spend a lot of time on people uh, telling people what to, what to eat. Uh, uh, I'm also influenced by the fact that uh, dietary recommendations vary, change so rapidly from one uh, decade to the next that I'm always a little bit concerned to be uh, uh, too um, too prescriptive about what people should eat. Uh, I think that it's much more important that they much more important what they eat is how much of it they eat, and uh, portion control, decreasing the total amount you eat, is much more important on the whole than what you eat. And, I'm sorry, I am a, that is a bit of a heresy, and I apologise to the BSLM for saying that. No, it's. I think it's very interesting how through generations uh, things shift and our understanding, uh, and also how the culture changes with time. Super important to recognise that change and how we address uh, this kind of constantly changing platform. And definitely exercise is super important. So for those who would like to incorporate, no matter where they are in their life, what are the three steps that they could take to start incorporating a lifestyle driven exercise regime? You can't do far, go far wrong by, uh, by uh, trying out the, the Couch to 5K app on your telephone. That's a good way to start. That is definitely a good one. And certainly uh, a lot of my patients and nurses uh, that I work with uh, have uh, reported that they really liked that app. So something to start with. Um, and for for the future, I believe you're start, you're actually writing or have written uh, the textbook for physicians. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it's really an expansion on, on the book. I've, uh, the, the, the Get Off the Couch Before It's Too Late book it will have a rather more scientific title i can't remember exactly what we're going to call it um, but it's it's to try and uh, get over the message to doctors uh, what they what we think is important for them to know about exercise the basic exercise physiology the use of oxygen uh, in the fueling of, of exercise and in the effects that exercise has in a large number of different degenerative conditions of later life I just want to share the screen with your book, Get Off the Couch Before It's Too Late by Dr. Hugh Battle. I highly recommend everybody getting this book to better understand exercise, uh, but also how you can use it in chronic diseases when you already had a heart attack, unfortunately, or um, you're suffering from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. It's definitely a starting point for getting more encouraged and also exercising safely. So you can get this actually now unlimited on Kindle um, from Amazon, where uh, you can get it free of charge, I think, uh, in your library. So nothing can stop you from actually getting this information. So thank you so much, Dr. Bethel, for uh, writing this really useful book. Um, we really enjoyed reading it. And also our patients have given us a lot of feedback to say that it's very easy for them to understand it. And it's very encouraging as well uh, from the fact that they felt very scared initially to move after uh, an event uh, in their lives. And it made them uh, understand that it is safe and also how to portion it throughout uh, their week. So thank you so much for writing it. It's a brilliant book. Well, thank you very much for being so kind about it. That's really, really nice. Thank you. It's brilliant. And we are looking forward for the uh, textbooks as well. Uh, we need it so much in our medical profession um, because more than ever, we need to encourage our patients to move and to move safely. But definitely it is much more um, unsafe to discourage our patients from movement. So we are looking forward to your textbook and we hope to have a discussion on that in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today for everyone who is on live stream um, on YouTube. Please hit the subscribe button to support our work and share this uh, conversation to uh, help everyone gain health and become heroes of their own health. Um, both from physicians and from patients' point of view. Now we are going to go off on our Zoom session where we have a little bit of a private chat that is not live stream so that we can pick your uh, brain, Dr. Bethel, about exercise and our health. Thanks very much. Bye, guys.